for example, waging war with two armies at a time during the same, in, on two different operational theaters at the same time, the same season, right? As we've seen at the siege of, of Pistoia in that video on the Florentine Vendetta as well. Um, it's something that basically just kingdoms can do. In medieval Europe, it's an enormous cost. So it's not, it, it's obvious that all this massive, bulky, gigantic force will at some point in when clashing with another one on the field will produce more bloodshed. It's kind of, it's obvious, right? You can't see it otherwise. Um, so the maintaining steady, uh, say remaining steady and maintaining control on the battle lines, coordination, using cavalry and infantry well, maintaining cold blood, this is discipline, right? This is absorbed the Aretinian impact as we've seen and, and managed to kind of wear them out after a, a bloody fight so um, for example the uh, company laments the fact that the Aretinians have less crossbow bolts right that people say well there weren't infantry wings there of course there were um, it doesn't even say that there were less crossbow and says there were less crossbow bolts Right. Maybe it does mean the same thing, but not necessarily. And even if it were so, it's because the, the Artinians were less, by the way, and the the the, the Florentines had kind of uh, tens of thousands of infantry that the Artinians didn't. So that's a big deal. It shows how infantry played a much greater role, and crossbows really do not care who you are. They're going to kill you anyway. Um, so this is the increase in... a in a civilizational military culture that definitely increases violence, right? The greatest lie that you can feed people with is that the increase of civilization reduces its destructivity. It's bullshit. Civilizations are such because they are stronger and they're always so, right? Unless they crumble, right? And they revert back, right? So the Artenians actually showed um, it's not that they necessarily were even fighting, in a, again, in a different way than the Florentines. They just had less resources. They were a less performing commune. They compensated with higher moral force from an indiv individual point of view. They were about to break the Florentines, but they were poor. They had less forces. They were a smaller center, telling the truth. And so even though they, they astonished the Florentines, they, they are defeated anyway. Um... And they, again, they compensated with higher moral force. They charge into the enemy, they massacre a lot of people, they didn't make it anyway. They get themselves killed in the process. I think uh, the Battle of Campaldino is one of the bloodiest in, in, in relative, in absolute terms in medieval Europe. Like 40% like of the enemy gets wiped out, something like that. And, and I've never seen, also in the entire, entire um, Italian communal warfare, such a high moral force like the one displayed by the Aretinians against the Florentines here. Because the even just the, the odds, the numerical odds are never repeated. Like normally even larger armies clashed, thirty thousand versus thirty thousand, things like that, but they they were leveled, right? Such a disparity for such a large engagement never seen in um, in this context. And um and it's also a pretty symmetric clash as we've seen. So no particular ground advantages, whatever. This is just brutal force, like unleashed and capacity to manage it in in uh, in this greater thing. And and what struck Compagni is also, for example, he again omits some other important details of how this battle went, but he has to remember the uh, the commoners that that insinuate crouched among the the horse uh, legs and they disemboweled them right and these people were likely not much just the the knights retinues garçons or something like that these were probably the the infantry wings that were clashing against th that cavalry was trying to attack it from other sides etc and um, so there is um um, a, a deep meaning here even the people that we've seen for example the Count uh, Guido Novello that is actually the 
deprived of the imperial feudality of Tuscany that cowardly escapes without without fight without even charging on the on the contrary such parvenu like the Cherki that everybody said these are enriched people they're not the old Florentine nobility they have more modest origins they behave like true knights so you see there even a uh, like an idea of you of the possibility of being able to earn that and that status that the Cherki definitely had already proven just how rich they were um, and triggering even the most noble donati in that sense against them because they were parvenu but they on the battlefield held they, this they fight like the true old magnates and so this there, there is this ferocious rage of the Florentines that were used to defeats that in the hour of victory start basically to massacre infamously the enemy the enemy the, the fleeing enemies however let's say if you really read the account as we've done you realize that the, also the mercilessness of the villains that uh, maybe at that point were also venting their frustration uh, of you know a life of you know abuses uh, suffered and you know misery etc it, it's not really described in um like Compagno was a very intelligent author he he was seeking also for some kind of political you know a re a reconciliation in the um, feuds torn Florence etc but he when he describes this this battle he, he doesn't seem to he 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 like he tells this like a story like it like it's like a movie in his head. You realize that, right? And he's 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 emotional about it. He loves this. He is excited by this whole thing. But he doesn't actually blame much. He just describes. He said, "Look, there were these things happening. Our people saw it, so that you understand the the, the importance of infantry in a way that rises, that uh, you know this kind of forces that are unleashed, and you know the, this massive." battle where the Artinians even surprised the Florentines but the Florentines had this greater insight from Barone who said you know you know stay steady with your nerves and let them attack because they you know if we remain ordered they, they can't break through that, that that's that's a big deal that that tells you a bit all right and he doesn't even say I'll oh, look at this dirty commoners uh, of course the Italian municipal ma mindset was kind of more lenient towards the villains, etc. But they were, but up to a certain point, like the, the Florentine citizens were, you know, they had all the rights, etc. The commoners were literally, like the peasants, were literally no ones, right? Nobody cared, give a damn about them. So, he, but he doesn't say, like, look at these bastards, it's just killing others. What a terrible thing. No, he doesn't give a damn. And this likely mirrors the fact that. It was normal, actually, um, and by a certain degree, to conceive that this could even could at least happen. This is the point, right? Even if maybe we don't find it much other battles. And, and what the interesting aspect here is that um, authors like Compagni and Villani are truly, in European history, the first authors that start describing battlefields like this. Because before there is not. Before there are much more concise. Um, sources that really are do not tell you all this they don't make you th this show right this instead starts becoming much more detailed much more insightful much more reliable also as a type of, of information because you realize this is um non non modern mind speaking and it tells you how how much synthesis exists in this person's hand he he realized all at once after 20 years it wasn't even there but how big and, and meaningful this battle was and for which reasons better than any other probably any other description that would have been arranged in a kind of more stylistic fashion could, could have rendered you right and this is again the first like in if you study I don't know the the Flemish chronicles at the same time the even places again that had a an important year but they, they don't write like this they seem like 100 years older um, they're still very archaic and primitive. Um, what happens in this area is because of that are incidentally the greatest areas of communal development and 
these are becoming have become effectively city states, right? Reflect also that we are we are children of these authors of the Renaissance. Florence, after all, started this, and and therefore we can approach more what what this reality really was. And for a few generations, by the way. Uh, because eventually there is the contraction of the mid 14th century that changes a lot of things. In fact, humanists do not really write like this. They are much more. Uh, first of all, properly the, here you realize it's a citizen, it's a magistrate, it's somebody that lived politics directly. Humanists uh, later on are just s uh, sitting in a studio. They don't see anything. They just write because they're paid by the, the masters and to take care of things, but they do not understand the battlefield anymore. This person was not a soldier, but he understood the battle conceptually, um, and he understood what mattered there. So we have this corner, actually, this cross section of of actual realism that, historically wise, it, it's a very, it, it's an exception for a few decades mostly, and mostly just in this. Uh, it's mostly. F Tuscan historiography, a bit of um, classicizing, kind of Lombard and Venetian uh, sources that describe it. Sometimes they are even more accurately the battle from a technical point of view, but this one, the, the vividity of, especially the so Tuscan sources, is, is extraordinary. Right? This Villani and especially the um, Pistoiese histories are some of the most insightful sources you can ever read about medieval warfare because they they're really unique in their context in their nature and they they're it, it's just one generation actually it's not even more generations that before there is less after there's more but it's none of this degree of um insightfulness and that shows you pretty well what it means when it when the world ages how the modern secular mentality eventually the soul, uh, you know, is the product of a of a relaxation, right? And so, initially, people who still live within the struggle. Remember that, just a bit like today, uh, and, and Generation Z already is a completely different thing, right? Um, and so, we'll probably be remembered, even, <laughs> you know, uh, historically as that generation. And this is kind of similar what you see there. Um, so extremely fascinating and in fact it's the end of a world a world that perhaps had never existed even but that at least had been vi vigorously dreamed of in a way the one of chivalry um definitely is a myth right when you read the uh the epos the arthurian legion the the german epos with all this chival beautifully chivalry they 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 are extremely artistic and quite but you realize that the ideal is not much an ideal as you know because it's supposed to describe how war was at the time but what was the meaning of universal action so people that say well but you know it's very uh, you know th this literary sources are very idealistic yes but but and 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 that's how in theory they they what what they believed do not really get the point and so you would think of the of the dreamy romantic myth of the nobleman who still lived in, in a world uh, in in wonderland and didn't accept the reality of warfare is a mistake because the universal meaning of those traditions were always there the point is that reality had always been different that the nobleman had always known that the infantry was was capable and and, and terrifying. Why? Because they recruited and trained them and equipped them themselves. Because they fought against it. Because they knew how important it was. So, say, pretending that at some point um, somebody wake up and wakes up and crushes the chivalric dream by, as if, you know, war had been dominated by killing less people for no reason. It, it's It's actually more likely that people hated more before than they hated later um, in 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 relative in uh, in relative terms individually wise because they were more loaded 
fundamentally. So th this um, pietà, you can't be merciless, can't kill those who pursue, etc. But it's a moment. After that, the actually the Florentine people stops even going to war. They they pay, increase pay, uh, uh, the the mercenaries. They 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 are very violent. When yes, there is enough evil in the city. Uh, the city streets are also a particular environment. But let's say they gentrify. Right, so, no, I don't think that a knight of the 12th century was more merciful <laughs> than, than a villain of, 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 the, of the 13th, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And um, nobody believed uh, what reality really was, even though there were some formalities that still mattered. I mean, being vile not vile. You see, for example, the, the Ghibelline reserve that does not intervene does not say Compagnia doesn't stop and say, oh, this is this is such a, um, you know, a, a vile person um, because, you know, he, he didn't uh, he didn't attack. You know, maybe he had his reasons. Um, maybe, yes, it was not honorable in general. It would have been better to die about it. It's not that people went to die just for the sake of it. If you instill instead this idea, you, you pretend that you know, if you look at the battle as portrayed, that uh, medieval knights would just charge into anything because they were idealistic. No, and we will talk about it now. And the misconceptions of the historiography uh, fabricated uh, out of a very poor and superficial understanding of these mechanisms. Um, you have to get to Ariosto in the Renaissance um, that. Um, talks about the great goodness of the ancient knights, right? So this world of values um, uh, that had once... But that's a caricature. Ariosto is notoriously also joking. His um, caricaturizing is ironic, is satirical in many ways. Albeit he does express, he, he's still able to express that melancholy connected to the, go the good old values that, however, become like a playful idea, rather. It's a bit too much to claim, as some ha have done, that Compagni adhered to the same great goodness of those ancient knights, right? And that um, that uh, romances and songs would have uh, kept celebrating for a long time. It just were dead now at that point. That word had, in fact, never existed. And Compagni actually reflects a much more, you know, modern vision of this all, uh, but also understanding more of it I in an improved sense, in the good way of modernity, that would not be understood much later on, where everything became a character after all, like we, we think today of the past. We presume to know it, like humanists did, but we actually don't understand it. So, getting these various shades, and uh, you see, this clashes so much with when I'm asked, you know, but, you know, during the 14th century, the 15th century, there was an increase of infantry. Well, but di did you even get through these concepts or ideas? Have you ever tested? Even just reading a simple source like this exposes you immediately to the complexity of what something could mean or not mean for those times. And, and it's also obvious that the feudal chivalric world declined. It had its own uh, splendid dignity. It had meant something. The point is, we too often connect it just to, to the Middle Ages. We we misunderstand completely that the Middle Ages are not kind of a, of a monad on its own, but that this same ideals, come straight from the archaic, ones, lost in, proto in the European, uh, culture that was reinjected eventually in chivalry. Uh, but it, it had always kind of been diluting over time. It, even the, the Middle Ages did this. There, there may be some coming back at some point. The feudal world rechannels them into an elite mostly. But it, the world had already aged. And the world had already kind of uh, surpassed that phase. And there is a gradual decline that the, middle, the, 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 middle, uh, the medieval parabola is not the paradigm of. It, it's a much larger thing. It's of a universal scale. It encompasses all history. We're still living through this. 
uh, through dying standards and uh, a general weakening of the, of the individuals, what we were saying before. There is an interesting example of this, because now we talk about uh, a 14th century author, just like a company, but like in the later times, uh, in the later decades, that where everything had already changed, already the seigneurial atmosphere had kicked in, already this kind of more courtly, um, uh, let's say, in fact, scholar had emerged. In fact, um, there is a famous episode in uh, in Dante's Purgatory, uh, the fifth chant. That refers to the aforementioned Buon Conte, the son of Guido of Montefeltro, that had died at the Battle of Campaldino, and whose corpse had not been found from the Ghibelline side. And Dante makes up the story. It's very, uh, like it's fictional, but it's very poetic and also not so strange after all to explain why why Buon Conte that he meets in the purgatory had saved himself that he could go in paradise and to make the, the long story short you know for anyone who, kn who knows um, the story which is overarchingly famous but I I have made last year for the 700th anniversary of Dante's death a, um, a series about him that I, I don't remember in which I think in the um, the one about the the commedia there are uh, there are five videos. I discussed Bon Conte's episode, and to make long story short, Dante wants Bon Conte to have been mortally wounded um, at his neck, and he was bleeding to death, and he fell um, next to a to a small to a stream that was next to the battlefield and before he's dying he invoke he repents and he invoke of his sins and th this was a, a knight right so people that were trained to to butcher human beings but of blinking an eye we already explained much of what knightly psychology really was to be those people right the Montefeltro especially were ultra specialized Dante probably if he did participate to the battle was among the feditori as a matter of fact and Bruni says that he almost got killed in the process because he had Dante's autograph very complicated story maybe we'll talk about another time but it's dubious at least um, or at least it's not ever been challenged but it's, it's just Bruni saying that it's a later humanist of the end of the 14th and beginning of the 15th century and, um, and but Dante was just like a uh, say uh, yes he was a knight he was a fighter you know he knew how to you know wh what the craft of war was he participated to sieges to other military operations but like the Montefeltro as we will see now were something else were considered like a stock of warriors right very different from a Florentine aristocrat or maybe not so different but they were becoming to be so different. Uh, bon Conte could have not written the Commedia, just to make an example of what I'm saying. And Bon Conte repents in point of death, and he calls the Virgin at that moment, and he dies. So what happens is that an angel and a devil come to him to take his soul. And the devil says, you know, this is a sinner. He has died in, in battle in this way, and you know, he, I will take it with him. And the angel says no, because he repented, he's saved, right? And the the soul says to me, and, and the devil says, but for what? For a little tear, you save him, because he called the virgin. And of course, the devil is shooed by the angel, but as vindicative as it is, it says, okay, you get the soul, but I take the corpse, and so. The devil un, uh, triggers um, a storm that um, w the, the water which swells the this the stream and takes away uh, Buon Conte's corpse that is not to be found. So the devil takes the the again the Catonic Dionysian material side of the story. The angel takes the, the Apollonian Uranian spiritual side of the story. It's a beautiful story, poetic to explain again why you can imagine what a battlefield like Campaldino looked like after the clash.
many people were just you know thrown in common graves and you know that they, they would like uh, they wouldn't even be taken away I mean a corpse after a few days you can't even properly recognize them yes they had badges and things like this but still many people despoiled them the villains the peasants stole the armor many of these people were stripped naked uh, right so it was just uh, animals eating them all these things you can imagine what what it really was so it was relatively likely to to get somebody lost among the corpses uh, but aside to, from this gruesome aspect let's say that there is much of truth regarding probably the motivation of these people i mean it, as we've seen the Artinians had charged like hell into the enemy life these people got themselves killed in the process would you do it would you be able of doing it there are stats that look at people that would be able to die for their own country. Uh, they're terrified. Uh, nobody claims. It's, it's not a, the fact that they wouldn't be able to. It's that the fact that they don't claim they could be possible. I mean, they don't believe in, in themselves to the point they disregard their own liberty, their own freedom, their own capacity of living in the world, their political responsibility. So there is an, an author of the 14th century, Benvenuto from Imola, that tells... Uh, yet another story, a fictional story based on the one of Dante's purgatory about Buon Conte. Because he mm, describes a mortal challenge, a terrible anecdote regarding the invitation of writing together towards hell. Between um, Buon Conte and Guglielmino of the Ubertini, it was the lord of Arezzo and the commander-in-chief of the Ghibellin army at Campaldino. And Bonconte is described as Boncontes Juvenis Strenuissimus Armorum. So, as he was thought to be, again, part of this special stock of ultra-elite military Apenninic, um, military, uh, in fact, mercenary professionals, that were trained since childhood like to be warriors there was probably there was a specific curriculum instituted for the various age where you were put at the head of a certain amount of, 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 of troopers and you would have to carry out some military operations very much like the early comitatus with initiatory rights it was terrifying right these people eventually passed on to to, to command uh, as we've seen 30,000 large armies as well as his father had done by the way and others would do of the same family and uh, Bo Bonconte is invited by the Bishop Guglielmino in in a um, scouting um, operation at, at Campaldino right and it, so it's all an invented story but if the, the, the setting is the, the battle that it was an historical thing and they started it at the time and he comes wha uh, and uh, so he had to wreck recognize the, the enemy force and Bonconte comes back with the precise opinion right of a professional military professional that the enemy is too superior and that therefore it's not the case to accept battle right and unfortunately we don't know what was the debate among the Aretinians and these other Ghibelline leaders before the battle because it was desperate in many ways yes we have some hint here and there but it's not we don't have at a point some properly this this heated debate because they knew the enemies were larger right the, the Aretinians already knew that we know it before any kind of reconnaissance on the field this is just in fact you see how humanistic authors just a generation after a few decades after the same people who describe fairly well the battle per se say something after all detached from reality how as if you know they didn't know how large the enemy army was with spies everywhere a few tens of kilometers of distance of cities that were they knew each other etc so it's the here's the chivalric abstraction that we have been began to be fed with starting from humanism on but anyhow it says something clever anyway that that so that the enemy are their enemies are too many so that in these conditions accepting battle was frankly quite a bold risk and he's not vile the author says like he's not vile um, in the same 
chanson de Roland, we have Oliver that says the same thing to Roland in the fray at Roncesval. And these were the same standard epos models of, of, the, of, of the knightly elite. And naturally, of course, we know what happens to Roland because he, he doesn't back down and he dies because of that. Uh, but there was somebody among these other paladins of Charlemagne who said, look, the enemies are too many, what the hell do we do? At least let's call the, uh, you know, let's call Charlemagne, because as you know, it was just the, the rear guard was engaged by the Moors in the story, actually probably were Basques and Moors, there were still Moors there, but not how it passed down to, to, to the beautiful masterpiece, but just to make you understand, and Roland, by pride, had not wanted to sound, famously enough, his war horn to call for help, right? He, uh, it, it, uh, the reasons are deep, right? They are based on the absolute loyalty that these men were owed and they didn't want to endanger their lords if they could carry out even the utmost sacrifice. And... Benvenuto from Imola here makes the bishop Guglielmino refusing in the same way to welcome the cautious and sensible advice of Buonconte. And on the contrary, he weaponizes in, it in an atrocious offense. Because he says to him, if he speaks like this, Conte cannot be part of the Montefeltro stock. Mm -hmm. So that was, of course, the the thing, right? Uh, a man like that could have ne was challenged, factually. Naturally, the same bishop um, there. Um, we were talking about uh, said the Lord of Arezzo was probably the same bishop that couldn't see the the Pavises, etc. It's the same guy, right? And as we've seen, he died in battle as well. So the clash here is profiled, at least in the story, as a as a challenge between the two great feudal lineages of the Apennine, the Ubertini and the Montefeltro, that were in fact involved in you know pretty interesting connections all over Italy, and they were kind of competing also among each other always in this military, uh, never-ending military struggle that occurred among the, the various city-states. And uh, there are other instances, for example, Paul the Diacon. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Benvenuto from Imola had copied this from the episode of Argaret of Paul the Diacon, when there are there is the Duke of Friuli and and this other nobleman known as Argarit, and Arga in Germanic was like, it means you were a coward, so it was the worst, um, worst offense, and the dukes, uh, they, they were attacking a Slavic hill fort that was hyper-protected, and Argarit says, but, you know, what do we attack for? Like, well, the long was saying that they're gonna kill each other, and, and the duke says, okay, then you're an Arga, Arga by name and, and by fact. And so, moral of the story, they challenge each other, they, the Longobards charge the Slavic hilltop and they get massacred. All of them. Uh, so, that, that's quite interesting. It probably was in this humanistic climate the Imolais author was, was thinking about Paul de Dier. Anyhow, it, it's this story. Um, Buon Conte um, is obliged by chivalric tradition to collect this uh, glove, let's say, of, of challenge, the gauntlet. And um, he proceeds lucidly with open eyes towards the end of the battle. And this is the answer of the, of the warlike bishop, si veneritis quo ego num quam reverteni. So if you come with me, you will not come back. Will you come? Do you have the gas for it? For it? It's a ride into hell. Right? Um, a warlike bishop. 
In fact, the Chanson de Roland has Turpin as a warrior bishop, right? So, in many ways, still, this was part of a, of a similar world. And it is true, again, that in the early 14th century, later with, with the crisis, that feudal world had died. In fact, probably the, we don't have to think of Guglielmina and of Buonconte so different from those same... Uh, Chanson de Roland characters, they still reason largely in that also, as we've seen, more archaic mentality, surely mu much less modern and secular than the Florentine one, even though they were just a few tens of kilometers away, but distances matter sometimes. And uh, the Ubertini specifically, in spite of his short-sightedness, ac accepts the challenge himself, right? Um, and the author says, Uterque probiter pugnans remazit in camp, as a, an admired conclusion. That is to say, they both, with great, you know, uh, prov provis, uh fighting, remained on the field. So, um, that the fact that um, even the bishop accepted, together with his young uh, comrade in arms to ride towards where you cannot come back um, may seem astonishing, right? Um, as we've seen, he couldn't distinguish shields from a wall curtain. You would say this is just uh, fiction, but John of Bohemia the chivalric son of Emperor Henry the Seventh, um, that when he was fifty years old and blind, uh, and he still wanted to take part in the fight at the Battle of Crecy in 1346, had himself tied to his comrade of arms and finding the death that he had for years at the fight in the melee uh, in everywhere in Europe, from the Baltic to France, from Germany to Italy, and so on. So, yes, there were these people. Knights still did that. Um, and it was normal. It was a way to devote themselves. This was the ancient devotio. This was what the this sworn oath, oath in, in the Comitatus really was. This is, what, this is what knights would normally do to motivate themselves. Um, and, and the capacity of... of um, of spotting whether something was feasible or not in war can't really be told until you do it and this is the real sap of strategic culture right you th there is no such thing like a science where you you know okay we can win this battle actually we will win this battle there's just yes we can win this battle but if you don't go out there and risk your life you will never even know whether that's true or not you will let slip away the same possibility so what will you do you will retreat until the enemy uh, can be defeated, and when? And why would he fight if he knows that he would be defeated? And won't he have advanced and seized what he wanted in the process because you gave way to him? So this is sometimes the most basic lack of strategic education that people have. I mean, look at people today that don't even understand the ABC of, for example, the necessity of defending Ukraine that's that has l that has become so a matter of you know whether you like Biden or not uh, how can you be so blind not to understand a simple logic right it's not that you have to make to make a, a, a favor to Ukraine as opposed to Bangladesh right it's nothing to do with that that's the the contingental reality of the story of what is happening it's not a moralistic issue it's literally what is at stake and if you're not able to discern that, you must have a serious problem. And given the civic deficit, and of course the complete lack of military education that exists in this world, um, with people trying to comment hopelessly on it, saying that the worst bullshit I've ever heard, um, such as you know people quoting Sun Tzu, and say, ah, you know, we can't even talk about these things now, but I know what the Russians are doing because they're, because Sun Tzu, right? Yeah, Sun Tzu even says that, you know, you, a general should never besiege a, a city, for example, um, which is 
yeah, exposes the bullshit of Sun Tzu in general, or at least that should be contextualized as well. And no, it, it, quoting Sun Tzu it doesn't mean that you actually have any form of military intelligence whatsoever. Uh, but just for saying, you know, people joke, play. They're like children. They, they quote things they don't know, they don't understand, they have no competence on whatsoever, and pretend to make it work. The same goes for the medieval, um, the medieval knights. What did happen at Courtrai? Right, we will talk about it. Because you see, this bourgeois uh, that shoot crossbow bolts and dis disembowel horses uh, while knights went lucidly, apparently uselessly, to their own death um, is um, still you know, a caricature of paradoxes that surely affected the nobiliar culture, but just as a way of saying, not for what would happen, not practically on the battlefield, but in the way, in what it could be done on the battlefield. Surely something has changed. For example, Robert Bresson um, interpreted exactly like this, his own end of the uh, Knights of the Round Table. Right, they, they get massacred by the commoners at the end of the day. But the concept there is much more universal and traditional. After all, the storming of the Asgard, the twilight of the gods, um, this, this in idea of the impending doom of the world aging, um, of the fact that there is a decline, that all cultures traditionally say that there are specific ages and we are in the last one where there is probably the, 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 the lack of awareness in, in human souls of, of what is the sacred and, and, and the truth, etc., is realistic as hell. In a sense, you cannot be a knight and not will be willing to get yourself killed. Uh, if you do, you're, you're not, and so you will lose, likely. And this is the entire point. So even the romanticized version of kind of cavalry decline and uh, the death of chivalry um, and the uh, the end of nobility in the process are of course nostalgic in a way they do show of course that the world changed but as we have seen the aristocracy was still in charge and actually even strengthened his own control on the community uh, it's as if it had gentrified itself it, it really happened in many circumstances but they were still in charge so it's not a monofactorial equation by saying you know even infantry gains power so um, it was necessarily about infantry as a, as a technical mean, if you like the mechanistic or technologistic bias. It was much else, right? You don't have to force anyone to fight uh, to, to the death if he can win in an in a easier way. So something changed, but something changed because things evolved too, right? And so uh, it takes more competence to manage the, the bigger system that can lack, that we civilizationally have lacked, and causes more problems. Uh, surely, uh, I don't know, migration era, Chipton had a much more concrete um, understanding in probably in that kind of foreseeing capacity about a local, you know, his own times award than even a late medieval nobleman had. Because the, the latter system was much more complex and evolved and advanced and more difficult to predict. Um, but the aristocrat also had it easier individually, so maybe he had also lost uh, additionally the um, you know the, the care in the process, right? For also sending those damn infantrymen to die, because after all, they had never cared much about them. Maybe you know, 12th century must not a uh, leader would have cared much more about his infantrymen than a than an early uh, modern prince in that regard, surely, because he knew what the difference they could make still at the time. So that's the game that we have to play here. Not saying, again, those imbeciles at Courtrai they got themselves killed. Now, during, in fact, the Frankish, uh, the Franco-Flemish War of 1300-1328, uh, and that's why that's not an, an, an anecdote, the flower of French, uh, of the French cavalry had a bitter experience of, 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 of surely of, of a time change, but what kind of time did change? A teleological time where infantry will always rise to the sky without any stop? Definitely not. Um, 
the um, these changes uh, had been triggered essentially by the rise of the commoners in areas that very often were peripheral, like Flanders was one of them. Feudalism had kind of eroded, and these are areas that even arrived later compared to the more advanced ones, as it often happens. So in normally in northern Europe, you have the trend was a decentralized place, and uh, there was also a specific political and strategic contingency to to battle like the one of Courtrai, right? Um, so, when we look at, for example, this battle, and again, I made a video on it, and it's a very interesting battle, and then I explained this, how the French were really competent about that battle, even if they got themselves killed, and it was a disaster, right? It doesn't mean that if things end wrongly, it's because, um, you know, people were stupid or incapable or inexperienced, um, especially at this time. Right, you, but even you're not more intelligent, responsible, or competent, or expert than a World War the First general. You don't know how to win the <laughs> World War the First better than those guys. But you have been um, properly manipulated to to pretend that you are, because again, you have never even stopped to to actually think uh, strategically what it is to fight World War the First and why it was fought that way. You think of machine guns and shells. You should think about countries and and that's the scale of um of shortcoming that our mentality really undergoes uh voluntarily by the way so when you look at courtray um to which point like this dramatic um you know the back of uh the knights is to be imputed to technical military issues and how much the political and social and, uh, and broadly moral and in this sense incalculable attitudes really really matter right um, if you read the sources if you study them if you compare them to others you can arrive to some kind of conclusion to this um, were the knights habituated to underestimate the infantry not to consider them even true proper fighters and wouldn't they be really uh, uh, full of disdain towards the bur the, the city bourgeoisie? Um, the question is, they could mm, do everything except the first, right? Um, because even if these were not true and proper fighters, it's true, the Flemish weren't. They hadn't picked up a weapon up to the day before, right? Not quite literally, but I mean, they weren't being prof military professionals at all. Right, not even anything like th this. Armies were not used even to take the field, differently from as we've seen just the, the in parallel the Italians and so on. Um, and they, uh, this may have played as a sort of role, maybe misunderstanding, say underestimating, uh, in the sense that you know it was just the first time they were fighting against them. But it's not really an excuse, right? Because the French knights again fought against and together with infantry all the time and they controlled that infantry themselves right so they uh, they use infantry at the same battle of Courtrai um, and they consider the fact that the Flemish position is strong and what people don't really do they like to stress the butchery and the disorder of the French army but what is not really told there is that they were able to carry out a charge after having reformed, crossing the channels, etc., and literally breaking through the Flemish phalanx, and if it hadn't been for a Flemish reserve behind, the French would have won the day. It would have been one of the most clamorous victories. Um, actually, not one of the most clamorous defeats, uh, because you, you don't know even equals to that, but they went that close to achieve it. So when you talk about the French in that sense, the good lords of the war of Philip IV, and you say that they you know they simply didn't give a damn about this man and they, they hadn't gotten properly you know they simply went to war as if they were going to on vacation to a camping to a to a, a gentle ride you don't know anything even about the sources people say oh no they, they didn't take any precaution they didn't look at, at the preliminary study of the terrain what sources sta state explicitly it was a debate exactly about that and there were french knights that said look this is dangerous and we have to be careful. 
And others said, no, we have to attack because there were other reasons. Like an army doesn't attack just because, you know, that guy at that point wants that. An army is constantly pressured by the sheer um, political, um, social, economical, logistical, moral costs that it undergoes. It's, it's a system that decays second after second. Um, and you must take an action. Right. And if you don't take that action, you just prolong the struggle. And von Clausewitz wrote extensively about this. That's actually wrong. You should be loaded to the point of getting things over with quickly, if you can. Right. And determining if you can is a problem. The French almost could. And that's a part of the story that nobody usually tells you. Because we are iconoclasts, modernistic, uh, democraticistic, repu uh, republicanistic, statistic, collectivistic iconoclasts specifically, who want to, sh to show that those French knights aristocrats that were managing the situation, and even won the war at the end of the day, and uh, were never defeated again in the same way, uh, um, and on the contrary, French military culture kept defeating the Flemish throughout all the 14th to the 15th century continuously. Right? This didn't originate any kind of military reform, Flemish, uh, the, the, the Flemish case is, is quite uh, iconic because uh, literally until Guinegat, the Flemish didn't win a freaking single battle. And they fought either against the French or against the Burgundians, they were French anyway. Um, the same feudal military culture by which they were defeated with the same armies that they fought with at Courtrai that didn't even update because they were against just a bunch of bourgeois in a phalanx without much of a cohesion, but just they had a lot of courage and a lot of determination. But in order to charge, as we were explaining it before, to charge, to take action, to abandon the advantage of defense and pass into defensive, you must have the greater moral force, the greatest capacity. You have to master the tri triad. This is what von Clausewitz says, that that is put a test for the attackers more than the defenders. And the French went that close to win. And they had estimated that in a probably consistent way. doesn't mean that somebody didn't screw up, they didn't realize that, but let's say, would I have you been better at calculating that? Because you cannot calculate that, if anything, because there are moral forces involved. And so you cannot mathematize the thing or thinking to, to have a positivistic explanation for it. If you don't do it, you can't know it. They tried, they almost made it, they failed. And they, they paid for it, and not only but the, um, let's say, if you want to do that, you have to concentrate your full forces for doing it. You can't do it a tiny bit at a time, because war, in war, odds are practically balanced at a point. And if you want to do it, you have to concentrate forces. You have, you, you have to go across that damn channel, between the channel and the infantry, and risking that. And, and the French knights knew perfectly well what that meant. It's not that they were surprised when, I said, when they saw what happened. They perfectly knew the consequences of that. Guess why? Because they were freaking military professionals, and they perfectly knew what that meant. Because that's like the ABC that they knew since they were 14, uh, right? Where you, you, you can't study it for decades. Sometimes people don't, still don't understand it um, today. Um, and actually, it's the same exact thing that happened at Campaldino with the Aretinians. The Aretinians charged en masse. They had two battle lines. We haven't read Villani, but I tell you how it went. I, and uh, they charged all together. They couldn't charge like one at a time because say, okay, let's see what the first attack does and if it doesn't, you know, let's reach it. Because if you don't concentrate your entire forces, the enemy is it's twice, uh, two and a half you numerically, he will overwhelm you and you will be defeated in detail. So you have to go to right into that hell and either coming out of that victorious or dying. And that's the entire point of the universal tradition that was essentially based on a religious military principle that either you're able to self-sacrifice yourself or you cannot get the highest reward in divine transfiguration. And that's why Ghibellines that still fought with the eagle, the Roman eagle on shields and believed in that world order, were able to get themselves killed like the Bishop of Arezzo and all his um, his his comrades. So, who died, were massacred, like some of the most powerful people there, all got themselves killed, right? Because they chose to get into hell. And you can't get out of that. 
And this is what normally you don't read because you don't have knights telling you. We don't have the account of Guglielmina. And even if he had it, uh, he would have not written about this because, you know, he he knew what what, what his deal was. And in, in even in the literary purposes of that time, he would have not even cared to write that. Um, it took a, a Dante or these other figures to eventually tell us and we're very lucky we have them because there are just a few sources after all but there was an entire world that reasoned like that millions of people that were mostly commoners but that commoners that knew perfectly well that mentality too it just they didn't have the means and they accepted that in the hierarchy um, because the hierarchy was functional to the existence even of their polities that otherwise would have been taken over by their enemies so if you if you don't get in this order of ideas, you can hardly understand why the French cavalry got itself apparently massacred at, at Courtrai. Um, and especially, you will not understand it if you don't study the freaking battle from the sources, right? Um, so the uh, ideas, but th I found this even in some. I remember I accidentally listened to years ago some uh, famous figures on YouTube about medieval warfare for this more juvenile audience about weapons and he met all this thing, that that insist very much on this idea that um, <laughs> you know the French were charging this the commoners they, they thought were so stupid they, they they were so stupid because they thought the commoners were worthless like you know it's simply Martian and how dare these people fight us you know uh, commoners were everywhere in the world that <laughs> they had always been and and we have the actual French debate before the Battle of Courtrai from the sources that that actually state us perfectly well that they knew what the terrain was about they they had allegedly even captured from a Flemish turncoat um, um, a, s a map of the various um, uh, the various traps that the Flemish had disseminated around the channels to actually lead the attack so whoever thinks that this thing was unplanned they didn't know the terrain they didn't care simply hasn't even read the sources that is the ABC of history without which you will never be taken seriously by anyone but we do need to 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 say that anyway and making other people wrong believe in a wrong thing in a false thing in a thing that is unproven has any evidence right um and 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 who does tell you by the way that that the french at that point would have not been even more eager to be successful to even fight with even more you know hatred towards commoners that were absolutely felt to be some subhuman beings this is absolutely notorious but this doesn't mean that the subhuman beings were told to be nothing they were told to be like better than animals but they, they knew that perfectly well what they were able to do in open field they had them in their own french army they used them to target them with the crossbows etc so um this delusion i hate to use Zynga because he began to spread this idea that for the french knights war was um yes a profession but in a, in other sense and especially allegedly which is in my opinion and i'm a cause of it and i totally reject this thing because it's pure culturalism game feast chance of exploit but especially a game a play where people were didn't kill each other because the, the concept of the, the war game, according to Zynga, is that basically there is a level of, of brutality in, in totalitarian warfare that before did not exist because people before just f made war as a game, not as killing each other. Are you freaking kidding me? I even made a video about this. Like, it's the most idiotic thing I've ever heard. Um, also, knowing you, Zynga, and his work and, and everything he, he made, like, I, I, I totally loathe and reject the entire cultural... Uh, and background and from from which he comes with that um, so it's not true that the French were unprepared of the dark harsh rage of the bourgeois they had known uh, all, all along from centuries from ever uh, and um, and it's even kind of a bit hypocritical and superficial to claim that for example for the commoners 
war was um, was was not a joy but something bad, costly, and necessary parentheses b within the production and the traffic. Well, but what do you think that knights had it uh, had an actual fun in getting beaten and killing and massacred? Do you realize the burden, the weight that these people had on their shoulders? No, because we have desacralized the concept of elite and of leadership and authority. So we have to think that these people enjoyed war just because there were chants that said that war was beautiful. Yes, war was beautiful, but that's an ac exercising way of saying, yes, it, it makes you spark emotions that nothing else can. It, it's, it's testing you. It, 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 make, it makes you grow. But you have to suffer a lot. You have to work a lot in order to obtain it. And especially being trained makes you realize how important it is war in the first place, politically. And that's the reason why, for example, the Flemish didn't develop into a military system that was effective, because the, the political connection with war, and so the necessity, the mechanism of it, was not wanted by these people. These people just were reacting, right? And they were not thinking on the long run and saying, okay, well, um, for now, well, hardly people could think on the long run, this is true. And the, the Flemish were absolutely capable. I'm not saying that, you know, that they were just idiots themselves, but let's say between them and a French knight, definitely a French knight had a much clearer understanding what it ta what it what it took to, to rule a country for you know in a more functional way, uh, as a as a broader organizer or whatever than these um this commoner sport. And without mentioning, by the way, which is also often forgotten, that the Flemish army was actually led by knights. Um, so, this is true. The, the, it, it was the Dampier comital dynasty of Flanders that incidentally was a, a fully feudal military clan. He ha they had fought, in, for example, in Italy very often with Henry VII, with others in, in southern Italy with the Anjou, because they, these were f f French vassals, by the way. Um, they knew the infantry. And they, uh, you know what they, they do when they come to Italy? They fight as knights against the, the other local knights, but also the infantry. And what they do when they come back to Flanders, they don't have enough knights to cope with the French. They have just this masses of, of Flemish infantrymen. And what do the commoners say? What they do? They command them. And they even train them, by the way, giving them their expertise. And they get even themselves killed in the first line to to support the example so pretending that even Courtrai was merely a an explove um, of commoners per se an infantry per se it's just an episode within a sea of feudal warfare that swallowed it uh, after that <laughs> that didn't have an actual consequence in may maybe on a moral sense it surely had Courtrai in, in a sense marked an era Right, even if we don't want to reason teleologically, yeah, it was perceived as a big deal. But from the same sources of the time, when you realize that this miracle is described like a miracle, that the Flemish were considered, as Villani says, for example, just you know, rabbits filled with butter, uh, up to the day before Courtrai, um, and they actually remained that, as we've seen, because they didn't uh, collect any other full victory or uh, especially against the say against the french a bit there, there is mon et etc but it's a s win lose situation right it's not an and then after this war they just lost anyway while most armies out there were feudal still in the meanwhile for for a couple of centuries um in the region the uh, say not in the flemish that again maintained that thing but they also didn't score anything against the the feudal culture that's what i meant um you realize that it was not considered normal in the first place, right? In, in this, if you study, for example, reading the Chronicles, um, if you study the, the sources of the Battle of Courtrai, you realize that uh, it, 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 it's astonishing that the commoners have won that battle, especially as, as infantry, right? Because they said infantry alone doesn't make it against cavalry. It's never happened for 200 years. Um, that's extraordinary. But it's not that these sources kind of rebel on that thing. They, they go on telling other stories, and there is, you know, all the other battles that are normally cavalry versus cavalry and, you know, 
a very few armies that even took the field with just infantry and got crushed most of the times, or that properly, let's see it better, they wouldn't take the field because nobody was so foolish to go at war just with infantry when you had cavalry. That's why, for example, there is never like such a thing like an Italian infantry victory. Not because Italian infantry was worse, but because no city-state would ever think to go at war just with infantry when they had regularly cavalry, per se. Uh, in the F Flanders were different, but this doesn't mean that um, what happened at Courtrai was the product, again, of such, you know, booming culture of the military revolution of the infantry. It, it's, it's all fiction. It's all fiction. Great victory. The Flemish scored an astonishing... But there is all a mythology about Courtrai. Right? There is uh, Xavier uh, Flary that wrote an interesting book about the battle that actually doesn't even tell too much about the, the fight. As always, that's a proof of what I say when military historians very often don't care about combat. But he uh, is a Belgian historian, by the way, so he's kind of from within at least the same uh, mythology of, of, of Courtrai that is, in this sense, also a bit mythologized, in my opinion, also by that book, but in, a s in, in part is also deconstructed because it says, for example, what do we know about the golden spores, for example, that where they really hanged at the cathedral, where's the proof of this? Like, it was more the local tradition that eventually made historiography and that made Courtrai what, what is considered today by us as Courtrai. But what about, it was not even a large battle. Um, as we have seen before, for example, Campaldino was larger compared to, and people say, well, it's just one of the many battles of the communes. Oh, okay, but it was kind of, you know, a bigger deal um, from a strictly military point of view. And, and this happens all over Europe in many ways, but people don't care about that. Why? It's not that you shouldn't study Courtrai. It's one of the masts of medieval warfare, and you can't be a military historian if you don't really study it for, for the Middle Ages. Um, but, again, what did we actually think this thing like and why did we decide to make it a symbol of something that is regarding the poor French cavalry that that's what I, I can't stand that were dramatically competent and showed it at Courtrai dramatically like they showed it during the the hundred years war um, defeats per se do not mean much it's how you are defeated that counts rather right some mistakes are big mistakes like uh, you you may never know also what the decisional process was really behind that. I'm not saying that people didn't make mistake at the time or that, but let's say they were still within an order of ideas that was much closer not to make mistakes as military historians today on average do. And that's the real point because if I I were in in um, in with I I did have the task of having to reconstruct these things at some point and. Um, as a historian, I need evidence. I need I, I need to formulate a theory, right, in trying to answer what we can't answer by a certain degree, to express a judgment, to realize, uh, as I do, right, always beware of those people who tell you that historians is not about judging. Those are just relativists, and they are the worst kind of, of historians. In fact, those that are disintegrating history. But you also need evidence, and you need to be fair about something. If you, If you don't have evidence about somebody being incompetent or an or being there a broader issue that um, in a sense can mirror that or other factors interfering you you can't even say that right and most of these battles are not even very well documented when you read them um, uh, from the sources um, you realize that sources very often say one thing others another and so you uh, even big things and so you say but so what's the real version of the story. And then you have to confront all the sources and try to come up with an adequate theory. There remains a theory, because there is nobody with a video cam showing that battle to you after, you know, 700 years. So um, that would be the most beautiful thing ever. But um, it's just for the, you say, among military historians, we do this. Like we're saying, I was right. <laughs> no, it's not really that. Um, it, it's really let's say, seeing if our fort was to be rewarded, if we managed to, to motivate ourselves to the point of getting things right, and this is what history teaches you, to, to pursue the truth, and not a truth or the truth that you would like to hear, but the truth of how things really work, and therefore how well you know humans.
and not how much you hate them or how much ideologically driven you become and all these things where you can actually make a, cha a real change in the process by knowing that how they work fundamentally um, and there would be much to say about this but th that's why this topic is so important um, so yes a, a bourgeois was normally less prone to war than than a knight but whoops weren't we saying that then um, you know the 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 knight was kind of less competent didn't understand the nature of war who was just driven by insanity by emotionalism by ideals abstracted ideas uh, yeah but he lost yes but again in the order of things how much did he lose again how much did knights kept fighting and winning that way right um if there weren't solely infantry armies until the renaissance or prevalently infantry armies until the renaissance it's because until then it's not that people thought artificially that just cavalry work when it wasn't true it's that the infantrymen the commoners wouldn't have the courage to take the field themselves because they realized probably much better than us that they would have lost because when they tried in most places in europe they failed right and the parentheses of the first half of the fort, uh, 14th century where these victories, by the way, are concentrated just in places like, in fact, Flanders, Switzerland, maybe Frisia. These are also very peripheral areas. Flanders is just, you know, the most urbanized after Italy, but it's all Scotland, right? It's, 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 a, it's also where people really fought just with what they had. So this also shows that it's moral forces in general. It's not even how much cavalry or infantry per se you have. And this is exactly how the same nice reason at the time. They had cavalry and it was a way of war that had worked and that would keep largely working in spite of important defeats that might have been caused by lots of other problems. I mean, big as in cour, other battles. The French had an actual advantage. It's not that it was a fake advantage that we didn't understand because eventually the English won. No, the, the English were capable of winning because there is something you do for winning. It's not rolling the dice. It's people doing things and motivating themselves and killing each other. The, the, everybody could have won or lost in the same battle, right? For for minimal things that we can't see, right? It's actually the uh, the 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 rest of the iceberg that makes the difference. But since the odds are leveled, even a small thing can make the difference. And in that massive iceberg, you would not even see where the tip really is to make the explanation it wouldn't count anyway in a general sense because it's just specific to that confrontation but again most people don't really care to hear uh, or to understand uh, about uh, these things um, so of course knights fight uh, fought for glory to make prisoners to ransom people but they also killed they also massacred they also devastated they did affirm their ranking prerogatives, and who didn't? Didn't the, the communes affirm their own prerogatives? Um, didn't they want to unmask rich loot? Right. Wh what's difference? What's the difference between uh, the uh, the loot and the ransom that a knight could get from from um, in fact c uh, capturing a, an enemy in the 12th century? And you know, the the the. In economic income that crushing an opponent city-state would have for the merchant, uh, merchant oligarchy of, of a city-state in the 14th, right? Uh, it's the same thing, right? So uh, nobody really likes war. It's just that as military professionals and as the most powerful rulers that saw their power substantiated by the fact that, uh, that they, they were in power in the first place, War was understood as, of course, a part of their uh, kind of uh, gay youth and their flourished spring or whatever they, they thought of this thing. Like, and they, they sang about that. They loved that. But those are also people who were cracked and they would uh, burst in tears when they were told, uh, you know, about stories of princesses, etc. because they thought about their dead mothers and sisters that had seen the last time they were seven years old were, were taken away from their castles to become warriors and they had died of 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 child labor or things like that and 
and, and so you realize the complexity and the effort and the cost of being an elite uh, and, and having all the burden on yourself right the king of france surely had a much greater burden on himself than say ghent or Brugge, right and uh, these things matter in the world also because of what these places are today there's a continuity there it's like the the, the French defeats of the Hundred Years War France is still here um, and uh, you know it's still here in, in a way that is determined also by a degree of political and military cohesion that has made history right and so the resilience of the system and its general worth there is highlighted and so the idea that the noblemen during the cold winters were bored in their uh, in their cast feudal castles without doing anything and they would just warm themselves up next to the fireplace uh, remembering the uh, the noble and beautiful deeds on the battlefield and listening to the deeds of Roland and Lancelot and just wanting to get back to the sweet time of Easter of the sweet May in which the flowers and the loves would have come back to blossom and they would have come back on horseback right is a bit really too ideal and their romances, in fact, said these things, but we perfectly know, even just from a military point of view, that uh, we've seen it in Campania as well, and we've seen it in other sources. Um, um, the, um, the moral blame, very often, wasn't quite there. For example, flank attacks in the 13th century were very common now, and also in the 14th. Like, you hardly find a source that says, okay, that was actual treachery. Maybe the ultra, I don't know, the French for, for Tagliacozzo do that because of the top level of what the monarchy hadn't even to be touched by a, you know, a shadow, you know, of, um, of claim of unfairness or things like this. But, you know, the average knight fundamentally, I think, wouldn't give a damn, even collectively, or nor others would necessarily think two words of them. Right, or maybe they had reasons not to do it, and, and using the excuse of saying this is an unchivalrous to to refuse for some reason. Um, surely, life and death surely w were had a different different meaning from today. Uh, they had a greater value altogether, but mostly in function of their actions, and these actions should be measured because if we know that reality was not like in the in the ideals, it's not just, it's not a hypocrisy in the first place. It means something that you have to be able to look beyond. Also, these sources had a very specific meaning and purpose, right? Um, and we have forgotten even what they had to make, even to actually discipline in further. Because this thing of unchivalric behavior was not even a real issue. There, there had to be an overall for example, hierarchy of command in a collective discipline, and this was functional to winning battles, even killing, killing more enemies very often. Um, you have seen it before with uh, the Mangiadori, and that uh, makes you realize, of course, that uh, the name was also about being having a quality standard within a competitive group that was had the force to say carry on that that devil that arrived to something definitely less ideally chivalrous but that mostly had to do with the individual kind of frame framed in the mess uh, in the chaos that at that point you know had to be relied on just by the individual later on it's about what's really the collective order and command and so you couldn't quite just be so blind to reality to pretend uh, you know just an action per se is the and th that's the reason of the renaissance right that the the end justifies the means like in machiavelli but that's that had kind of always happened as well it's just it's broadly recognized as a sensible thing as a rationalized th thought and uh, 
and still in a world that cared enormously about honor and more. Um, so, um, even if the bourgeois fought for killing and for winning, they they couldn't ransom anyone. They would hope to take out the knights as, as quickly as they could. But in a sense, they were also armed to do so, as we've seen in communal armies. And Courtrai again is just an exception because you have a solely infantry arm that the Flemish maintained, but that again also didn't score too much. For example, the Flemish didn't have much missile power. The firepower that it had the, the English armies or the Italian armies had, well, these people didn't. They didn't have a function. The Flemish didn't use wings. They didn't use any of that. It was just a simple fact. They couldn't even counterattack because they didn't have cavalry fundamentally. The infantry would break, and it did, and they suffered reverses exactly because of that. So it was terrifying. And very often, we don't even have a, a term of comparison. Bilani tells us, for example, that the Italian mercenaries are pikemen that Philip IV recruited from some Lombard and Tuscan contractors after Courtrai to face the Flemish and were sent there, impressed deeply the Flemish peasantry. said, what the hell is this? Like, they've never seen people fighting like that. Um, and they even scored some, uh, some important feat at Tournai against the same Flemish army in important numerical inferiority. But we had never seen, like, I don't know, an Italian army versus a Flemish army and seeing what, how it would go. I think, honestly, that, uh, especially because of the functionalized firepower, uh, you know, the Flemish would have had a lot of problems just being pinned down under uh, crossbow bolts. Uh, the French didn't use the Genoese crossbowmen properly during the Hundred Years' War, nor their rep the Genoese reputation, um, nor the French one. After Crecy actually was 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 uh, was crippled, right? Everybody thought again that I don't know the French had the best cavalry in the world. Um, there was nothing there to change it. Well, it was a by a, by a different degree. Uh, it was stained by these defeats, but and surely it reflected a decline, but it, it wasn't, uh, for example, a decline that was not happening in other nobility in Europe in general. It was a broader change, right? We, it just took the form of those battles because they happened, but not because it would have not happened anywhere. We don't know how it would have gone in, in other ways. Um, there, there would be really a lot to say about this. Um, so, the the equestrian edus um, was important, but it was more a political thing than a military one, right? Uh, the fact that the bourgeois were more violent and it just killed um, was pretty well known by the knights since ever. There are massacres, like of knights being surrounded by the rustics while they were looting. It had always happened in a way, and there were commoners standing their ground against against knights throughout all the Middle Ages, even when cavalry was uh, kind of at the top, right? Um, maybe accidentally, but it still happened. And infantry also had its own life and way of, um, of developing, even autonomizing itself. And or, however, still being integrated most of the times um, with, with cavalry as well. Um, so, uh, I don't think personally that there is much um, controversy regarding this topic. When we look at the com commoners' weapons, the the hooked angonas, the halberds, um, so something between a, like mostly people think that halberds were, for example, anti-cavalry, but we, we, th this is wrong, right? Only pikes. Pikes are the only anti-cavalry weapon. In as a White steel, one, like a melee one. Then crossbows that mostly kill horses, rather. But the 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 cleavers, the bills, even large daggers. Think about double hand axes of the Scots at some point. Um, uh, you know, they were also evolving. For example, the Italian uh, bill was the the first weapon that evolved as a piercing, fracturing, and cutting weapon at the same time. It required a great fancy. 
and these weapons however were born um, to attack cavalry only when it was pinned down other when he had ex uh, exhausted the cavalry within, uh, against infantry that as we have seen was not even the first objective um, or when the infantry attacked cavalry on the side and most of the times it was other cavalry involved in the process right and so all these weapons that serve to unhorse knights to to disembowel their animals and also um, penetrating uh, uh, wisely and cruelly uh, within the um, say the gaps of, of the armor plates were part of a broader civilization that you find also in a sense in, in the in the knightly equipment by the way because they use that against other knights as well <laughs> you know think about pole arms and uh, the um, the interesting thing about this is is always this kind of weapons where if you dig archaeology they had always been around right um, it we, there are if I'm not wrong at Sampak it said as, 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 um, that the halberd at, at one point cut in a half a night which we don't know how but some of these weapons acquired even a sort of national status the, the Swiss Volge for example and halberd even way before the Goden that, that was not even the thing that the Flemish called it Gepindestal it was not you know, but there were many of the various weapons that existed at the time. And yes, infantry was to remain important, right? It was um, in the mid 14th century, it was not like a sudden decay. It was just a professionalization in smaller numbers than seen before. And this is often also not really realized, so that people just focus on these weapons and saying, oh, look, they grew more functional, so infantry had to grow in importance. Not necessarily compared to what had happened before. Most of this trend is sinusoidal and it mostly reflects uh, an evolution that was un uh, ongoing also among the various knights, also considering what knightly warfare really was. Like cavalry warfare at this point becomes ever more specialized. Cavalry becomes um, either enormously more uh, powerful like uh, larger breeds, uh, plate armor developing, so a massive Night others become like skirmishers, etc. So you can find all of this in different guises, and of course, the commoners were um, were ever more introduced in this business, but not quantitatively, right? Because there are commoners and commoners. Commoners again are mostly disarmed by the mid 14th century. They give up. These large infantry formations are extremely costly. They, in fact, they didn't want to fight. So on the long run, they lost the battle anyway. That's why feudal, uh, why Europe refeudalized, right? Um, and uh, yes, there were commoners hired, but they were much less, and like proletarians, and paid by the, the same aristocrats. So it's not an increase of infantry to cool at all. And if, again, if you've studied late medieval warfare, you actually should know even by which degree this is true, right? Uh, and consider that the the knight still remained something formidable to 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 knock out like w once he was on the ground um let's say he could still defend himself um some you see people when they're fighting for their lives they can't even even when they know they're already dead they, they can um unleash an extraordinary force right they, they could be surrounded by three four ten this rough um, commoners and um, and uh, he could strike back dramatically. Armor was heavy. People say, oh well, it was fully ergonomic. They could make stunts with that. Well, it was really heavy and could impair movements. So, it so it's not a myth that knights were not impaired by the movements, especially in pretty traumatic situations. And and it, it still required a, a great athleticism and resources that you could not spend like in a row even just so easily and knights uh, as any other fighter at the time knew how to dose their own energy because you cannot fight for more than a few minutes in a row you're destroyed you cannot be employed uh, you're exhausted right and um, this is visible even the uh, one of the few kind of sensible and evident things in reenactment is exactly this where you see that <laughs> people are visibly exhausted after just a few minutes of fighting because they're not even supposed to fight like that. 
So this tells you also how warfare was becoming more complex from a tactical point of view. That is to say, movement also, and cavalry was important for this as well, um, um, was not really an infantry thing, right? Uh, infantry was still bulky, right? Even when the Swiss invented the thing, it's the mid-15th century, first of all, um, but they, they have a risk themselves because they have to rely just on, once you're gone, against the enemy you're done for like there you cannot come back if it goes wrong right so it, it takes enormous guts and again there was nothing deterministic about winning winning every time um but the rest of the infantry doesn't have that flexibility like medieval warfare is also in fact marked by pretty heavy infantry that has um even if it has a counter-offensive capacity etc is still kind of defensive in nature and you would expect it just mostly to to stand its ground while cavalry mostly acts. So there are many reasons why the late medieval warfare remains dominated by, by cavalry, right, until the Renaissance. Um, um, knights were professionals of war. If anything, the, the difference that this is important is that, is that this other infantry troopers or even commoners in general could still fight on horseback. We're, profe we're becoming professionals themselves. And as we've seen in that video about the me uh, French medieval, medieval French nobility, um, the uh, traditional nobility was exhausting itself in an historical process. It was not a mistake of a single country or a way of a single ruler or people. It was happening all over the world. right? Knights died out, right? properly from a mental point of view, because the same reality isn't quite required anymore, but as we were saying, in the moment in which knights were cited by the professionals of war on the ground, um, the nobles still ruled actually even more strongly on this system, which shows that they had the means to actually counter these troops, maybe by using the same troops, but still having secured a power that could not be they they tried with the jacquerie with the revo uh, revolts in the in the um, in Flanders in Italy in the textile industries etc. They were crushed. They were cut down because also most of the people, frankly, didn't like them at all. And the same people who had disarmed themselves had mostly given this power to the elite that was making things work. That was creating more advanced states. We've seen it late medieval administration um, a great improvement was made to secure the system so yes cavalry and as an arm gradually um, declines over several centuries but at the same time the elite secures a greater power that it can still unleash and still again late medieval warfare is a lot about heavy cavalry a lot about it to the point it had even rendered obsolete infantry it was not just a demographic or economic collapse that brought it it's just that having tens of thousands of infantrymen on the field regularly costed too much and these people were just not professionals largely at least and what was the point for them to keep fighting when Still, cavalry was the decisive weapon. For example, if you wonder how in the Italian communes the thing ended, at some point cavalry kept being hired in larger and larger and larger numbers via mercenaries, because the Italian city-states had more money. It was centralizing. I made videos about this. Um, and um, infantry basically disappeared because when you have three four five six thousand heavy cavalry on the field they did right they did they freaking did just milan alone had from five to six thousand barboot like uh, does it that's a freaking kingdom you realize that the whole community is paying for that they wanted that to happen because they were the strongest option and those were the regions that in the 12th to 13th century had had the strongest infantry in europe doesn't this ring you a bell? Right. Um, so, again, the emphasis on the fact that there were butchers now on the battlefields, that, oh, 
you know, they 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 crush the the ideal ethics of knights that didn't used to kill and all these things, and they knew how to pierce armor with this terrible weapon does not exist all right it, it's an invention it's it's still people like to believe it but it was just a gradual non-continuous thing and again at a purely tactical level where most of its firearms eventually change mostly the the game gradually but that doesn't count that still cavalry dominated the field and the the expression of cavalry politically was still in charge right um, and this with all due respect to the commoners who perfectly knew how to reach an artery <laughs> under the uh, say um, between the plates um, etc and, and to kill the freaking knight that they hated right uh, when you look at the Swiss uh, you know the Habsburgic heavy cavalry learned to um, to deal with um, people that objectively didn't have any special anything special in their war for shepherds and mountaineers of Switzerland. It was not even one of the most developed areas, right? But the same could be said by Frisia, by Scotland, where instead the, literally the most depressed areas. And instead, you have Flanders and Italy that were so the most advanced and in, in these areas as you've seen infantry didn't even uh, prevail right Swi the Swiss also would take a lot to make it prevail or at least you know in Flanders it would prevail as we've seen but just essentially to effectively isolate the country to make it fall under the Burgundians later on so nothing special um, and the, the, by the way, the Flemish refused under the Habsburgs at, at Guinegat to fully professionalize like the Swiss that in the mid 15th century had created the, the, the professional phalanx square model. Uh, the Habsburgs trying to import it there. The Flemish say nuts to them. So that just to say how politically and morally that's what makes the difference. The Swiss had created a business. The Flemish had another one. They didn't want the Swiss one. Right, but also the early Swiss were just um, who were they? There was there were masters in chopping wood, um, causing avalanches to obstruct the the mountain paths. Right, they were rough people of the of the highlands that were they were clashing for their own freedom by using would have set unloyal weapons. Right? Yes, it was an ambush, but you know it's not the there is much to be complimentary towards the Habsburg in you know, not realizing you're falling into an ambush and that you're defeated actually not even be necessarily and that's what in fact we don't know about the Swiss in the early times whether they were because their infantry was actually strong right? if you attack uh, a cavalry army in Colon you're done for uh, they, they're, I mean they're done for it's the same thing that said Compagni before the Florentines took the bad way the, if the Aretinians had ambushed them like the year before they had to the Sinis, they would have wiped them out. Instead, in open field, they defeat them. In fact, in the case of Switzerland, it, it's exactly the point that you don't really see fully... There are good infantry victories, but they really stood their ground and they defeated the Habsburgic charges, the Savoy charges, etc. Um, inflict damage, but it, it's very often the terrain. It's like a hilltop, uh, an ambush, some kind of uh, also maneuver, right? Somebody arrived uh, unexpectedly from a direction they didn't know that. Uh, so this kind of betrayal, maybe that that the, the Habsburgic knights would have surely said, "Oh, damn! Th these people have betrayed us. They are unloyal. They're just dirty mountaineers, freaking commoners. They're worthless." We're better, etc. Yes, they lost because that's what happens in war normally. People lose because they don't see sometimes things coming because objectively they could come at every time. You can control literally everything, um, and there is a merit for those who manage to s carry that out safely and successfully. But as I was saying before, and I made videos about Swiss tactics. Uh, the Swiss in this early for in the 14th century are re relatively marginal because they um, the, the most clamorous infantry victory is Courtrai, as a matter of fact. And there are other uh, 
instances of even the Catalans at Cephissus against actual cavalry. That's very interesting. Um, cavalry charges, you know, in, say the terrain there is always key. There are either swamps or ditches or whatever to facilitate the defense. But in this regard, um, that's what it makes it even less remarkable because if if it if that ditch had not existed uh the the clash would have been similar to another one that would have fought been fought maybe randomly in another place even in the same campaign because armies move in different places it's relatively random what kind of ground they pick because they don't always have a choice to have such advantage so how many battles were won actually by knights against infantry um, that just didn't didn't bring to that so that's most of them would remain even exceptional right there are a couple of tens of battles in the, for the first half of the 14th century for example that really show you that this thing happened it was a broader phenomenon whether it was the centralization from powers and crises um, mostly um, this kind of also not always actually emerging estates of commoners um, so what well, well came what came there for material and moral force etc were enough to win it's a broader systemic thing but for example they happen just in some areas of Europe right again it's just essentially Scotland Switzerland Flanders Frisia the German Dithmarsh and the English army does that too, but say, what about all the rest of Europe? And infantry was developed there as well, so also in very similar, actually identical ways, but why didn't, why were these uh, ba uh, battles concentrated there? If you don't study the background, you can't say why this thing could have happened maybe in the same way elsewhere, but uh, again, for the same contingental factors it was not necessary even right this idea it's not that again don't think this through a classist lens you were not talking about infantry versus cavalry as two distinct worlds it didn't happen in most of Europe simply because cavalry and infantry lived in the same communities and they didn't need to oppose each other right that's pretty much it and an important view all right, for today, however, I stop it here. We will keep talking about these topics. Uh, however, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.